master's was in fact uh, in immunology and molecular biology. So it's really my favorite, one of my favorite things. They taught micro a ton, so I love it. But first, some definitions that you know all of these words, but maybe they haven't really been presented to you as true definitions and stuff like that along the way. But epidemiology is really just the study of the frequency, distribution, patterns of disease. And so epidemiologists want to recognize those things so that you can try to control and eradicate disease. So um, that becomes important in terms of reportable diseases and stuff, stuff like that. So it's good for you to kind of understand that because this is really about communicable kind of diseases or infectious diseases. Um, some more terminology, pathology, you know, that we're, well, it's a study of the disease process and uh, so forth. An infectious disease is caused by a pathogen. Um, so uh, so uh, that really kind of excludes oppor uh, opportunistic sort of organisms, but they can be passed one from another person, certainly, um, if people are, are immunocompromised. But a pathogen can take a healthy person and disease them. And so that's what infectious disease is. Communicable diseases are passed from human to human. Not all of them are, uh, do that. A contagious disease would be one that's easily communicable. So the common cold is a contagious disease. Whereas, oh, so many others are contagious, but far less so. Um, I dare say tuberculosis. Certainly it's contagious and it's a big pandemic, but it, it's not that easy to transfer from human to human. It takes a lot of doses of it to get there. So that's kind of a, 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 a numbers difference. My ear is closed, so I feel like I'm talking in a bucket. <laughs> Am I, if I'm not talking loud enough, tell me. And if I'm talking too loud, tell me. Yeah. That's how that. Um, incidence and prevalence. Incidence is really the number of new cases, and these are typically defined within a region or an, and or a time period uh, epidemiologically. So the incidence is new diseases that might arise in a year, for example. Prevalence is the number of cases that exist um, in that particular geographic population in a particular time period. Morbidity and mortality, I'm not sure you've heard these words too. Morbidity is the state of being diseased. So that's different than really prevalence because a person can have morbidities or a variety of diseases. So this becomes really important for like coding and admitting to hospitals. You want to list all the comorbidities because that kind of ups the um, uh, diagnosis for admission. Uh, confidence that you can get, or confidence that you can get that, that paid for by insurance. But what's really important is someone's true history and physical. And as PAs, there is no one that does history and physical better. No one. No one. No, no medical branch that you'll run across does histories and physicals like a PA. And I took great pride in that, that this would be this person's best history and physical they ever had. And so as you're doing them, and they take four hours, you'll get better, and they won't take so long. But man, we are so good at it. And so that, those, listing those morbidities is so great. One of the first things you can do is just look at their drugs and see what they're taking their drugs for. Morbidities. But it certainly goes to your knowledge of how to treat them and what to expect diseases might do in this person. And it goes to diagnosis and... Um, um, projecting how long you should treat them and stuff like that really so that's that the contest of comorbidities my doctors are always in rehab hospital oh got to get all of them because we won't get paid on a knee if they're not also really mm -hmm. sick and stuff like that so that sounds self-serving <coughs> truthfully you're treating your patients best if you know everything that's wrong with them so, mortality is the number of deaths due to a disease as sporadic diseases generally are well controlled diseases <coughs> through whatever method, sanitation, vaccination, that kind of first world issues uh, that can occur, as it pops up within a, a population, so that's considered a sporadic disease. 
there are endemic diseases that are always present in a particular population, and so often we say that this is due to some sort of bi biological vector that would transmit the disease that lives in a particular region. And so this is a great example of malaria because it is a protozoan disease, plasmodium species, <coughs> Uh, transmitted by the Anopheles mosquito when she takes her blood milk for reproduction. And so it therefore is tied to that biological vector and to where that vector lives. And so you have an understanding of that already. And you see the purple, uh, that's not purple at all. <laughs> Orange. And the fall colors, the autumnal colors that you see there with the distribution of that species of mosquito. So there are a lot of those, especially protozoan diseases, that have really complicated life cycles and are tied to, to uh, quite often, arthropods. Uh, malaria, 250 million cases a year. And it's so preventable. Um, just mis the mosquito net thing has been one of the big deals. They try to eradicate the breeding places and stuff like that. But simply sleeping in a mosquito net increases the incidence, a million deaths uh, uh, annually, and it's endemic, it's just there. Epidemic means a great, not sporadic, but think sporadic exponentially. You hear the word epidemic a lot, and so these are things that kind of wave through a, a particular population and is related sometimes to um, something seasonal and maybe it's some kind of contamination within a, within a food source or a water source. So you definitely hear about those epidemics where, oh, peanut butter, oh, there was a ton of peanut butter. You couldn't find peanut butter, especially Peter Pan. They had some kind of problems. It was a dark time. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Bluebell ice cream. There was a, that was a dark time for Texas. Um, you know, Taco Bell. There'll be somebody with hepatitis and like that. Those are epidemics. Certainly, the flu is something that we think of. But those are quite often pandemics, which means involving continents. So um, there is. There is, if you're really into epidemiology and infectious disease, I don't know you are, uh, disease certainly, you, you, you have a feel for this probably, but it was really disease that would spread through a population that had more <coughs> than, um, ammunitions and so forth. We've, we have, via our technology, we're so beyond being able to be wiped out by just disease, we have weapons that can do that. But, you know, for, um, for example, the end of World War I, the Spanish flu killed like 20 million people worldwide, which is unbelievable to even imagine. But so wars that didn't kill nearly as many people. But so often it would be an outbreak within the population of the uh, soldiers or whatever, and that would kill more of them than, than the actual war itself. In those, in those days when the war was fought in the more hand-to-hand -hand combat, although I guess that's true still. Some current pandemics, tuberculosis, morbidity, two billion. Think of that next time you're on an airplane. <laughs> Why don't you? Incidents, nine million new cases per <coughs> year globally. Mortality, um, 1.7-ish million a year. HIV, we think of that as a chronic disease now, but it uh, isn't for other countries where they're not treated with expensive long-term treatments. HIV infection, 33 million. AIDS death per year, a couple million. And so there are population, there are places where it's just, you know, it's really nearly endemic. A bunch of people. So anyway, those are some terminologies. Pathogen uh, capable of causing disease in an otherwise healthy host. Pathogens have um, then what we would say is virulence, an ability to cause a, a cause disease. They have weapons that they, with which they can cause disease, and those are known as virulence <coughs> factors. And so they are either something that helps them evade the host so that they can 
so that they can set up shop and uh, colonize. Um, or they can actually be, um, destroy tissue or immune response to that cell. And so those are virulence factors. And they can be viral. viral uh, viruses have virulence factors. Bacteria have virulence factors. And some protozoa will have them as well. And so the various infectious agents, then it is viruses, bacteria, fungi, and protozoa. Or, or protists that you, or parasites that you have heard of. And so some examples of virulence factors, pili, <coughs> capsules, those are, would be bacterial um, coagulases, hyaluronidases, those are secreted enzymes and toxins which can actually interfere with host cellular function. And so those would be largely bacterial sort of virulence factors. So when we think of infectious disease, what you will be diagnosing and treating will so largely be bacterial in nature. You'll have a few fungal diseases and you'll have a huge number of viral diseases. Lots of them you can't cleanly diagnose because you won't be able to culture it or you won't have an assay for it. And you won't always be able to treat them because we don't really use a lot of antivirals widely. That's changing. You'll see more of that change over your careers. Um, so you'll spend a lot of time, I hope, educating patients um, about why you're not giving them antibiotics. And so um, they, it's you. You've heard this before as you've gone along throughout the uh, <coughs> program, and certainly during infectious disease, you hear this a lot. But you certainly know this already that uh, antibiotics are so glorious and then you work and you work and you see people who cannot who have common <coughs> infectious bacterial <coughs> illnesses that can no longer be treated and so you really you will really have to spend time missing people off while you educate them <coughs> and you all know someone and maybe you are someone who just that first day, that throat is sore, you want an antibiotic. And so, and you, if, you, if it's not you, then it's a family member that you've already kept saying, you don't need an antibiotic, sleep on it. Sleep on it a week before you see, you know. And so you just keep doing that. And I remember having someone, it was John Malott, a PA in, in Kingfisher, and he just would walk in and ask them how many times they're gargling with hot salt water a day. And, uh, this patient population was so educated. They would come in with a sore throat and would say, well, three times a day. And he'd say, oh, and you're still, you know, oh, and that's not working yet. So how many times are you doing your neti pot or whatever? I mean, he was really educating his family practice base. And so um, he wasn't distributing antibiotics. They didn't want them. They learned they didn't want them. You know, I mean, so then you have your <clears throat> people with comorbidities and you're going to treat them prophylactically as well with MI. So, you know, you learn all that. You learn to teach people that stuff. That's your role. They're suffering and your role is to help them. <coughs> An opportunistic pathogen. Um, gosh, gosh, don't we love these really, though? Aren't they the ones? They're the ones that were, this is where you're really assessing how sick is somebody, how, how, how well are they going to listen to you. You know, that kind of thing. Opportunistic pathogens are able to cause disease in an immunocompromised host. And so immunocompromised can be comorbidities, but also just lifestyle. You know, if they're smokers and they're real stressed, they're not really going to sleep like they're supposed to. But they're a lot like you guys. You know, they know, they already know a lot, and they're not going to do what you know. You're not, they're not going to stay off that bad foot, and they're going to keep going and stuff like that. So that can that will compromise them, and so you go well. This is someone who this is going to go to bronchitis, so we'll get on it. You know that kind of thing. So uh, opportunists are generally normal flora, and they don't have a lot of virulence factors. They're just able to <coughs> colonize because there's a breach in that in that body's um, uh, defense. disease terminology, still transmission is a very big deal. For every infectious agent, you need to know its method of transmission. 
how is it, how does it get arrived in the body because that's the first thing, the portal of entry, how did it get there, and is it in a high enough dose to do any good, and has the person, does the person have any immunity against it? Those are things that all kind of come together before you can have disease. Transmission route, host to host contact, inhalation of droplets, fecal oral, a lot of that. <coughs> Thanks. <laughs> blood to blood. Fomites are inanimate objects like the ones that just got hosed with viruses at that surface. I'm far more I'm far more worried about fomites, you know, just like when you get to a table, I never use a pen like when they give you a pen, I carry my own. You know. Um, you're getting through a bathroom with kicking and all kinds of things. And then there's that one, that trick where you keep the door open. You throw the door open, th throw the towel out, and get out before the door closes. It's quite a lovely dance. Um, but fomites. Now, a lot of stuff isn't going to survive on a surface for very long. A lot of viruses do. Bacteria don't. A lot of, a lot of viruses don't either because they have envelopes and they're much more delicate. So, you know, you have to be uh, aware. And then another route of transmission um, is by a vector, a biological vector, other than a human. So, um, something that transmits pathogen to the host, like the Anopheles mosquito. A reservoir is some place from which that infectious agent is um, transmitted, from which it is transmitted. So it can be something in the environment like soil, pigeon droppings, um, that sort of thing. Uh, something non-living like a fomite, a living source which could be human or animal. Um, but the reservoir, the disease comes from that source without showing signs of disease itself. Or the agent comes from that source without showing signs of disease, the reservoir. So, in that example, Anopheles mosquito is a reservoir for the plasmodium organism. A carrier is one who is shedding, who is shedding that agent with no signs of the disease or a subclinical infection. So, they never knew they had it. Lovely typhoid Mary is one of those who was a carrier um, for typhoid fever and carry in the gallbladder, which is interesting. She was uh, hospice, she was um, criminalized really because everywhere she worked as a cook, people died and they put her in, in prison to keep her from her job, which was interesting, rather than have a gallbladder removal. Really. Uh, anyway, continue to shed disease post recovery and realize that every time you are post recovery, you feel better, you're still shedding disease. Shedding those infectious agents. A disease progression, acute disease progression. So the difference between acute and chronic, as you know, is acute has some sort of um, uh, peak, whereas chronic doesn't decline. <coughs> or chronic can have a, 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 an oscillating sort of effect with exacerbations. So you have the infection occurs, so route of transmission, portal of entry to the human body, a dose appropriate, and then the organisms begin to uh, replicate and grow in number. And so during that period is the incubation period before you would have disease symptoms show up. The prodromal symptoms, you have all of them right now. Fatigue, lethargy, dull, a dull ache somewhere. Everybody kind of has their own prodromal sort of thing. You know, mine is always gut. Everything is always gut. You've got your people who always have headache. You know, you have your prodromal thing. You could, you know, when you have a kid, you can look at the color underneath their eyes or just the color in their eyelids. You just know. You know your people. You know their skin. And you just see those prodromal <laughs> symptoms like that. They are not specific to the disease. So you've all had strep throat. The disease, the specific uh, during the acute phase are that uh, sore throat, probably a fever, um, those very specific things, the, um, the way the throat looks with the kind of pus pockets or whatever. But before it was prodromal, that, I don't remember 
really have the energy to do that. Well, you know, just exactly like you felt when you woke up. That's prodromal symptoms. <coughs> and so eventually, the acute phase happens with species-specific disease symptoms. And then as that begins to the wane, wane. <laughs> <laughs> hey Wayne. Hey Wayne. Um, because the body's immune defense is, is combating and eradicating that organism. And so that's why there is this de decline phase. And then convalescence is always longer than we want it to be. Um, you know, it's like a, it's it's like four days to a week for every day you were ill. So, you know, you really have to have people, give them plenty of time to convalesce, remind them to be gentle with themselves, remind yourself, and I promise you, every decade you get older, that convalescence is slower and lower. And so, you know, just tell people to be gentle with themselves. They get back, they get going really quickly. I don't know if I've told you this, but a girlfriend who had um, uh, cancer, reproductive organ cancer, she had a hysterectomy. And her doctor said, in six months, you still won't be yourself. Mm -hmm. And I thought, I was there with her at her appointment, and I thought, I wanted to cry, that was so lovely. And what she was really, I was thinking, what she's really saying, you're gonna feel a lot better in three months. But if you're still not yourself in six months, give yourself a break. She didn't say, oh, you'll be fine, you can just return to work and you'll be yourself. She'll just be like, you know, I want you to return to work at X. But know that by Christmas you're still not going to feel great. And I thought, you know, that gives her permission to take it easy and convalesce slowly. And I loved that. I thought that was so gentle and so um, um, permissive for her to take care of herself and understand that she's also been through something emotionally big well, you know, so, and illness is, and also her husband had just died, it was just such, so, it shouldn't have happened, she shouldn't have happened, had to have had, we were like, well that sucks, you shouldn't get cancer, I'm taking, I'm talking to Jesus about that, <laughs> that's not fair, but you know, some people it's just one thing after the other, anyway. all right, so, now, we're talking about defense of, uh, uh, of infectious diseases. So the rest of the whole thing, you're going to be talking about the infectious diseases. Here, where it's, what, what is the body doing? So it's this war that's being waged, and I think of like a seesaw or a teeter-totter. Do they even allow those on playgrounds anymore? Probably not. Um, but we used to just, I probably have like a back injury, um, some sort of sacral nerve injury or something from somebody dumping you off the seesaw. But anyway, so what are the things that the, that the body does, and they're here, the physical and chemical barriers, then there's non-specific immunity and specific immunity. Those are the three arms of defense. So first, physical and chemical barriers to disease. You can name all of these eventually. Skin, great barrier to disease, <coughs> waterproof, so lovely, flexible, able to, to interact with the world, yet remain barrier to disease. The mucous membranes, and that is going to be the mucus itself, that mucoid, um, uh, oh, what am I trying to say? The flow of mucus itself. The mucus itself will entrap agents, but then you have that ciliated flow outward um, of that mucus mantle, and so that's a great way to expel as you're going along. So all the all body surfaces that are open to the outside will have mucous <coughs> membranes. Normal flora is NF. <laughs> I'm sure there's some other meaning for that that I'll just scream out later. <laughs> um, uh, NF normal flora. So you, know, you are just covered outside and in with uh, organisms that love to live there. And just the fact that they live there, that they're not going to let anyone else in very well. When there is a disruption in that mantle of normal flora, then it's very easy for something that's also normal flora or something that's pathogenic to take residence and overgrow. And so you have these overgrowth patterns. Um, and so um, the, the fungal infections like candidiasis and vaginal, uh, oral candidiasis, vaginal candidiasis, and colonic candidiasis are kind of examples where most people are, um, have 
candida as normal flora, and if there's some change in the other flora, the candida will just overgrow, and then that's really an opportunistic kind of infection. So the normal flora, they're, they're your friends. Um, and so this is really the whole probiotic thing, you know, is trying to help establish your normal flora. Um, and I'm plus minus on it. It's one of those things that works for your patient or for you, then uh, by all means do that. And if it doesn't, then it's okay. It's something else that's going to be helpful to them. Acidity itself is a great antimicrobial and antiviral. Um, the um, uh, vaginal cavity, acidic. The gastric contents, acidic. So a lot, you're ingesting a ton. Of, you're ingesting a shit ton of shit. <laughs> in a day and everything else. And so um, all of our foods are fecally contaminated. We just, what we do is make sure our foods and waters aren't contaminated with pathogens. But it doesn't mean to say, they're, they're contaminated with tons of, of organisms. And so really, we have a great immune system. We have a great physical and chemical barrier so that nothing can breach that. You don't even have to engage in it. But um, our, our, our gastric acid is, is, is really, Right on, gastric acid. You go, you go kill stuff. Um, and so, you know, you have to really respect anything you can get by that. <laughs> respect it every time you're on your way to the bathroom. <laughs> uh, bile itself, that's something else that gets into um, the intestinal tract, um, as an example. So, bile is going to have. Uh, a lot of things in it that will emulsify bacterial cell walls, for example, for one thing. Also, uh, pancreatic secretions will be proteases that will be antibacterial, antiviral as well. Interferon, now that's something that cells um, will send up as a flare if something's going on with the cell. It can release interferon and tell neighboring cells something's going on, arm yourself. So it's kind of like a ring or whatever those <coughs> monitors are on the front door, you know, and I'm telling something's going on here in the neighborhood. So we have a lot of things. They're non-specific. They're not meant to get rid of just candida or just um, um, staphylococcus. They would just get rid of anything in a non-specific, broad-based barrier. Now, if something does get a little uh, past that, we have another line of defense, which would be the nonspecific immunity. Once a, a breach has occurred, or you have ingested something, it's made itself to the bloodstream. So let's go back to blood. <gasps> Remember blood? Remember? There's the aqueous, the aqueous portion <laughs> and the cellular portion. Just to remind you, the aqueous portion is plasma. That contains the clotting factors. Serum is no clotting factors. Um, and you have three kinds of formed elements or cellular elements in blood. Red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets. So there's your erythrocytes. Remember what they do? They do. And then, do I have this? No. And then the white blood cells. So you have the formed elements, red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets. White blood cells are only 1%-ish of that whole thing. And then here are the flavors of white blood cells, neutrophil, lymphocyte, monocyte, eosinophil, and basophil, and in their relative numbers. And it really is kind of useful to have a feel for this because when you glance at um, lab reports, you'll, you'll want to know if this is neutrophilia or neutropenia, you know, based on the, the apparent numbers of those. Things. And so, I, I don't know if I've told you this before, but it's never let monkeys eat bananas. I think I may have said that before, and somebody has a different one, which is not, not memorable. So, <laughs> never let monkeys eat bananas. I just always remember that, and you have neutrophils. So, another name you've seen neutrophils called, and it's just everyone has their thing, but PMNs. That's maybe a more common, what you've heard them refer to, but it's the same thing. And that would just mean polymorphonuclear uh, neutrophil. And so you look at a, well, a neutrophil there, you see that it's a multi-lobed nucleus, and that's kind of where it is. So anyway, there you go. So there are erythrocytes, red blood cells, a nuclear um, red uh, hemoglobin bags, 
And then you have the white blood cells. We can divide them into granulocytes and uh, non-granulocytes or agranulocytes. Granulocytes look grainy. And so they really are going to be burping out tons of stuff, which will be reactive once stimulated. And so that really does go to their function. So it's not without um, any meaning. The, and I don't care if you remember what's a granulocyte and an agranulocyte. It doesn't really matter. I just want to put them into sort of perspective so that you, you see them. So all the blood cells are coming from a common progenitor cell, the bone marrow, and will become the different classes, erythrocytes, platelets, and the white blood cells, or leukocytes. And so you see the myeloid cell line becomes these um, granulocytes, and there's a lymphoid cell line that become lymphocytes, and then the um, monocytes come off of a little bit different line, and they are agranular. I don't really care that you remember this, just to remind you the relationship. Oh, and they're just so pretty. So here are the five white blood cells again. And, and adding in the agranulocytes, which will include two classes of white blood cells or leukocytes, the monocytes. Monocytes will mature into macrophages. So when you've heard phage um, or macrophage or monocyte, dendritic cell, those are kind of the same bulk. And then there are lymphocytes, and those are the B cells and T cells. And so leukocytes are white blood cells, and lymphocytes are a subset of white blood cell, B and T cell. And so when you've, you've already done all the leukemias and the melanomas, so you've, you've gone through, through this, and um, I'm just reminding you here so that you know who the players are, because you didn't talk a whole lot about the function of the lymphocytes. You talked about their dysfunction, and when you had Penia or um, osis, highs or lows of either one of those numbers and how those look. Uh, and then platelets. I just, there's something really mysterious about platelets to me. That you have this megakaryocyte that fragments and those fragments are platelets. And they're, they're really going very much um, as, and I didn't really include this at all, but as a non-specific defense. <coughs> sealing leaks in the cardiovascular system. So all the clotting agents and platelets are really important for that. So not only to seal from what can leak out, but to seal from what could um, come in as well. That's an important part of that. So the lymphatic system, to remind you, we, we make such a big deal about the cardiovascular system, don't we? Um, that we do not talk about the lymphatic system very much, but you know it's a series of lymphatic nodes and vessels that return fluid leaked from the cardiovascular system into capillary beds daily. It's a slower system, and it is full of white blood cells to do this sort of surveillance, uh, elimination, and immunity. So there they are. So the lymphatic cells, the lymphocytes, are the cells of the lymphatic system. Although really all white blood cells will relate to that. And there is this kind of milky appearance to lymphatic uh, fluid, lymph, which is really kind of uh, white blood cells. So, red, so cardiovascular fluid looks red because of the erythro erythrocytes. So there really is something, something to it all. So the nonspecific immune response, so there is a response, but it's to any invading agent, not specifically, oh, that's Staph aureus, I know you, I've seen you before, this is going to be a specific special ops mounted against you, but this would be like, oh, whoever you are, get out, mm -hmm. uh, nonspecific. So once the organism is breaching those physical and chemical barriers, nonspecific response occurs. So phagocytes are the res first responders. So white blood cells are phagocytes. That simply means any kind of cell that can engage in amoeboid movement that will engulf foreign particles. Those foreign particles can be dead or dying cell excuse me, cells, uh, bacteria, funguses, chemicals, 
all the little crap that we eat that's not even real at all, things that the, the liver can detox mo molecules, but phagocytes will detox stuff, kind of cellular debris. And so white blood cells are phagocytes. Most any white blood cell can phagocytize. <clears throat> Have I said that enough now? <laughs> so the neutrophils or PMNs are circulating, also highest in population of all the white blood cells, so that's great. So they can arrive when there's trouble and sort of begin to do cleanup and recruitment of other cells. Monocytes are circulating. They can become monos uh, phagocyte, uh, sorry, monocytes can become macrophages and tissue. There are also resident monocytes and tissue, which we call dendritic cells. And they were especially prominent in, um, oh, the gut and lungs. So monocytes circulate macrophages uh, are of mature uh, monocytes and tissue, dendritic cells and skin and membranes. Oh good, yeah, I have that all there. Microglia in the CNS are going to be phagocytes that are resident to that. And then GALT, gut associated lymphatic tissue, also malt, mucus uh, membrane associated lymphatic tissue. So anywhere you have a surface that would be exterior but not skin. So, you know, upper respiratory tract, oral cavity, vaginal cavity, um, uh, colon, anal vault, um, all exposed to the surface of the outside. The whole intestinal tract, tons of Associate, get associated lymphoid tissue. So that would be clusters of lymphatic tissue without actually being a full on lymph node. So it's a way, like Peyer's patches in the gut, a way to scatter um, uh, immune tissue everywhere. So GALT would be gut associated lymphoid tissue. So here's phagocytosis itself. I feel very strongly that you probably would have started seeing this kind of picture in eighth grade ish. Do you, do you remember it, Craig? Mm -hmm. You were soaked in hormones, so you may not. <laughs> you became different. We did, I did, you did, we all did. Your kids will. You will see it. They become, they go from being able to look you in the eyes and actually understand the spoken word and return the spoken words to just not being able to do that. <laughs> because the brain chemistry is changing and they're soaked with hormones during that time. And the good thing about that is um, it goes away. <laughs> it gets better. So like six-year-olds and you guys are so much more mature than you were at 16 and 18, you know what I mean? You can see it yourself too. Because the brain chemistry is changing um, and the brains of um, uh, adolescents and young people, college age people, you aren't considered that anymore, uh, are wildly creative. And so areas of the brain for creativity are just on fire during those years. So being soaked with the hormones isn't so bad. Um, I'll, I'll give you this. Uh, do you know who Led Zeppelin is? Mm -hmm. So like Robert Page and Jimmy, uh, Robert Plant and Jimmy Page were like 19 when they wrote Steer Away to Heaven. So next time you listen to that, you go, okay, the brain soaked hormones. Now their brains may have been soaked with something a little extra. <laughs> but that creativity, that wild, ambitious, I won't die, I feel so alive creativity that you've lost. I can see it. It's gone right now. You'll get it back. You have to give room for it. But anyway. That was eighth grade, and that's why you don't remember it. Because you could have ridden Stairway to Heaven, but you lost your chance. <laughs> so anyway, I think it's just, and when you're, when you're taking care of adolescent patients, you know, acknowledge that. You know, why are you doing with this, all this creativity and energy you have right now? I hope it's not harming yourself. You know, because a lot of times kids seek pain they seek pain during those years. They become very self-destructive as well. So anyway, that's the one that you tighten knuckle as a parent through those years. Um, phagocytosis. 
chemotaxis is the ability to move towards some source. And so phagocytes will spit out or degranulate lots of attractants to attract phagocytes. Tissue that has been damaged will release a lot of cytokines. There will be flares that will send or, or recruit phagocytes to that space. So they're attracted to a particular space for a reason. Um, they attach to the agent or cell or debris or particle or whatever it is, and they ingest it. A lysosome or a little sphere, a little stomach that's in that thing that's full of digestive enzymes and uh, so forth will fuse with that ingested vesicle, forming the phagolysosome, and then that ingested particle will be destroyed because of really two main things. One would be digestive enzymes in there, and the other would be this, um, this oxygen burst of activity to create um, free radicals, and then you just uh, oxidize the agent to the hilt. It, it, it renders it, it denatures proteins, it renders um, viruses inactive, it kills bacterial cells. The thing is digested, and then parts are sourced, and then the rest can be eliminated or kind of burped out, I like to say. There is a respiratory burst that is associated with phagocytosis, uh, and so you can see a large uptake or an uptick of oxygen use by phagocytes, and that's because there is this generation of reactive oxygen species. And so when you heard about oxygen species and that oxygen is oxidizing, it's because it does what to molecules or to electrons. It takes them, it's so hungry for electrons, it will steal electrons from um, any uh, molecule. And so it's very dangerous to molecules. The biggie is DNA. You hate for it to get screwed up. And so you have to deal with oxygen, but if you blast some bacterium with o o uh, reactive oxygen species, then it's going <coughs> to kill it. And what they are, who are they then? I don't expect you to know the chemistry of this, but just so that I'm not saying super reactive oxygen species and moving on, so that you see there's, there's hydrogen peroxide, superoxide, the hydroxyl radical, and a singlet oxygen. All these things are so hungry, they will just suck electrons out of the room and destroy molecules. So what we do, that's lethal for the phagocyte too. So you kind of contain it within this phagolysosome and it's protective to the remainder of the cell as well. So this is what we're doing all the time and having to get rid of oxygen. In our own systems, oxygen is lethal to our own cells, but we, we have a great source of electrons for oxygen, and that's that electron transport chain. And then we also have a lot of um, molecules that we keep in the cells that would sacrifice themselves for two oxygen. Those are antioxidants. So you think of vitamin E and you know these super um, uh, super foods like very colored foods like blueberries and blackberries and that stuff really have a lot of antioxidants or have a lot of vitamin E and other <coughs> molecules that sacrifice themselves to detoxify oxygen. We make use of it to in phagocytes to kill cell to kill stuff. Did I just say anything that made any sense to you? Okay. It's all right. We eat, we hear about antioxidants because oxygen itself is, is kind of dangerous. We like, we like it, we need it. That we're tied to something that is ultimately would be lethal without protection. Inflammation, the inflammatory response. I feel like you just you hear about it every single day in PA school. People really are talking about inflammation. It's a big enemy. It's a big enemy in her right now. Um, and, and, and whatever. The body is reacting to all kinds of stuff that we're, we're exposed to and exposing it to, and foods and things we drink and eat and take. But the inflammatory response is natural and it's healthy. And it is not spinning its wheels on healthy tissue, I guess, but it's a response to harmful, some sort of harmful stimulus or injury. 
So what you do is the, the capillary beds become leaky. You have an influx of more fluid carrying all the stuff, nutrients and whatever to the area, oxygen to the area. And then also phagocytes can exit more easily the blood system and enter. And their, their phagocytes, you see them squeezing through the little spaces that have been opened with a leaky capillary bed. And that process is diaphoresis in case you've never heard that word. Like a cat can get anywhere that its head can get in. So can a phagocyte. Uh, and what phagocytes do there is surveil what's there, take pictures of the enemy, show the enemy to the, fat, to the uh, 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 lymphocytes and say, do you know this guy? Have you seen this guy? Have you seen this guy? Has he been in this bar? Do you recognize him? What can you tell me about him? And phagocytes also will recruit more phagocytes, and they will also just sit there and eat up dead, decaying junk. And so you get, when you have a really great process going on, that's pus. And you get to know the real deal of the inflammatory response. The dead cells, the necrotic cells, the bacterial cells, the white blood cells, and all of the fluid that's come into an area. And the battle is being waged and won when the pus is there, generally. Or you're winning in the process of winning. Oh, speaking of pus. <laughs> mm. um, don't you just ah, get in there, get in there, but like don't go here, go here so you can really go. Mm. <laughs> Are the signs of inflammatory response? I've put this up before pallor, dolor, uber, and tumor, <clears throat> heat, pain, erythema, and swelling. So, there are inflammatory cells, you make the area leaky and you have inflammatory cells arrive. You know they're going to be phagocytes, the white blood cells that are circulating can enter the area. Really, we say kind of the first thing to come along are going to be the neutrophils. So they're attracted, the cells themselves when they get damaged will release tissue cells, epithelial cells will release cytokines that will call in the um, phagocytes. An example um, is like, for example, interleukin-8 will be produced by normal tissue cells and it will activate neutrophils. It will chemo-attract neutrophils. Neutrophils will come in, do their job, phagocytize, release chemokines, and it will just, you know, this, the, the thing is self, um, uh, what's the word I want to say? Building, uh, escalating. Lots of recruitment. Get over here. Oh my God. Um, which is the first thing you're supposed to do when you arrive on the scene, right? Is that what to you? I've done the CPR thing in a long time. But. Macrophages will arrive because they come in they are as monocytes and they'll be stimulated to mature into macrophages. And they're there and they'll do the same thing that the neutrophils are doing. And everybody's kind of doing it together, releasing more chemokines and our cytokines, chemokines, calling for more cells to come. But one of the really important things is to, that the phagocytes will be doing, is like I said, taking a little picture of that antigen and, and presenting it, that antigen or that foreign thing, and presenting it to the specific immune cells. So phagocytes are up here in non-specific immunity. They'll eat anything that they can eat. But what they will do is degrade that and take little particles off of that bacterium, for example, or that viral particle, and put, place them on their own cell surface. And then they can actually exit the area and go to local lymphoid tissue, which may be very close. It may actually be in the area because you have a wide distribution along the mucous membrane but also circulating in the blood and going to lymph nodes and going here to the specific immunity cells. So antigen presentation becomes really the big thing. So you've talked, have you talked about antigen presentation throughout this course? Probably with Dr. Uh, Latassi, I would think, to some degree, because you've done a lot of discussion of immunotherapy. That's kind of new to the PA world. We haven't been using monoclonal antibody as treatments forever. But anyway, so antigen presentation becomes the linchpin in stimulation 
a specific immunity. So the APC, the antigen presenting cell, is going to be a phagocyte that will place determinants from that particle on its own cell surface and show it or present it to the lymphocytes. Now, systemic <coughs> inflammation. So we think of inflammation always as a local response or a response to local insult or injury or irritation. When that response becomes systemic, then you have fever systemically, not just local um, heat. And so the hypothalamus will be alerted by cytokines at a, a level enough to simulate it, and you'll have an actual body temperature change or fever. And then so, some of the other kind of um, overall feelings that occur with inflammation or systemic inflammation. Inflammation can be so ramped up from some source that it can be deleterious, and you can really even have uncontrolled fever or uh, uh, massive sort of problems. And septic shock is one of them. I feel like it must be an infectious disease that you hear about septic shock, although you may have also in other areas. But that's really going to be <coughs> sepsis that is some sort of uncontrolled um, growth of an organism that overwhelms the body. And the systemic inflammation process plus that organism is going to cause organ failure. Septic shock is specifically related to gram-negative bacteria. And so one of the things that's so dangerous, and you probably heard about this a lot in geriatrics, but for, it's so often a gram-negative organism that can um, access the um, urinary system. And so someone can go from bladder infection to sepsis very quickly, especially elderly people who may not have had symptoms of that bladder infection. They first show up with, you know, in, endotoxic shock uh, from gram-negative bacteria that are sending <coughs> from the gut. <coughs> Excuse me. So that's kind of an example. But you can have massive um, blood vessel uh, dilatation that can cause um, really a shock um, to occur. So <coughs> that's a, an inflammatory response on quite badly. But certain organisms will elicit, they are pyrogenic, and will elicit the inflammatory response. Um, the gram positives, especially strep and staph, will do that. But the gram negatives overall are very likely to do that. If you don't remember who's gram negative or not, you tend to think of gram negative as something that's associated with the gut. That tends to be that way. That which is associated with skin, respiratory, is often gram positive, sort of largely that way. And so when you choose antibiotics, so often you take these broad spectrum things, you don't really care, but there are certainly flavors of antibiotics that are good against gram positive or good against gram negative. And you'll see that you have a little bit different milieu of antibiotics that you treat upper respiratory tract or lower respiratory tract gut infections with because of the difference in gram negative gram positive. Because their cell walls are different. And so the chemical that is able to breach that cell wall and kill that cell will be different. And you've been hearing about antibiotics a lot along the way. You'll hear more certainly here during this section. Do a little break.